And this brings us to probiotics. Probiotics are a really hot topic in, in both humans and livestock. We're finding out that most of the DNA in our body is not human, it's, it's bacterial living in, inside our guts. And that much of our immune response, our digestion, um, our mental abilities are all based upon what bacteria we have living in our guts that we have acquired from our mothers or from other human beings. Um, the, what the, is called the fecal oral route, which most of us kind of go, <laughs> and uh, is a new term <laughs> I heard recently, it's called farticles. <laughs> My sons and I <laughs> love that term. <laughs> Man, <laughs> I don't want to be downwind from your farticles, okay? The, the fecal oral transmission route is vigorously happening as we speak in this room, okay? <laughs> so we all share microbes, okay? Uh, when they get into your gut, or in the, this is from the bee's gut, they can form biofilms in certain areas, in the ileum and in the uh, rectum. Very few biofilms in either the, the, uh, the stomach or the, or the crop. <coughs> and then, um, so now we have um, um, probiotics being sold. The point is, you can't just take any old bacteria and make it a probiotic because it's not going to ever establish in the bee's gut. So if, if you're going to get one, you want to oh, take a look at the label and read which bacteria are in there and then compare that to the bacteria that actually live in honeybees. And what you'll find a lot of probiotics, there's no match whatsoever. So I had a question, and that is, well, if certain microbes in the our, our community structure of microbes in the bee's gut is indeed associated with better colony performance, you would see that in honey production. Their, your, your easiest metric of colony performance is simply weight gain, okay? A healthy colony puts on weight. A, a, a colony that's not healthy does not put, put on weight. <coughs> so I had a, uh, a, a, and this, here's our community structure. So this is the community structure of bacteria in pollen in coming into the hive. This is the community structure of the bacteria inside the bees. Notice they're, they're very different com community structures. So I was curious about this community structure that was inside the, the bee's gut. <coughs> so we had a, a poor production year a, a couple of years ago. Th this tells you how long it takes to do peer-reviewed research, which is why I just published my quick and dirty science in the, in the bee journal, thanks to Joe. So I will often finish an experiment and send off the, <laughs> the article within weeks to, to Joe. This experiment here, which I decided to go with actual publication in a journal, took uh, about three years to get, it just came out a few days ago. Um, I don't have the patience for that. And beekeepers, I feel the beekeepers would rather see quick and dirty results right away than waiting three years to find out what happened. So what I did, I went out to uh, several different yards of 24 hives uh, at the end of the honey flow, and a few of the hives made a ton of honey, and a few of the hives made no honey, despite having large populations. So I, I went to the two strongest hives, most not strongest, most productive hives, the ones that made the most honey, and the two least productive. But uh, for the least productive, I didn't choose weak colonies. I chose colonies that were busting with bees, but didn't make any honey. You all with me on this? My hypothesis I want to test is if certain bacterial community structure was associated with better productivity, you would be, there'd be a correlation in the high production hives as opposed to the low production hives. Yeah. Everybody needs to be with me completely on this before I move on. Everybody good on, on the hypothesis I'm testing? Okay. So I took, <coughs> all my research is funded by beekeeper donations. People just send me money and say, Randy, keep doing research. So that's, I don't write any grants or anything like that. If I don't get money coming in, I, I, I don't do as much research. If I get a lot coming in, I do a lot of research. Um, I wrote to a researcher, uh, Dr. Irene Newton, who had just published on, before I met Kirk, on the, uh, on the uh, gut bacteria, and I said, hey, would you be willing, or do you have a grad student, be willing to, if I paid you, to do all these analysis? And she said, yeah, several thousand dollars you do it, so I took beekeepers' donations and paid them to do the research. She sent me a bunch of vials of preservative, and I went out to those colonies, and to get the bees all of the same age, I collected only incoming foragers carrying pollen loads. And she had already done research saying that the gut community in the pollen foragers reflects pretty much the gut community within the bee colony. So we knew that was a legitimate uh, bees to collect. But by collecting all bees that were incoming pollen foragers, I standardized the collection of, of bees. And then each one I very carefully would grab the stinger, a base of the stinger with a pair of sterile forceps, 
pull the gut contents out and put a bunch of gut contents for each, uh, each colony into this preservative, froze them and shipped them off to her for analysis. She put a grad student on it. The initial analyses, the difference between the productive and the non-productive colonies, looks like there may be, be something there. And some of the, you get into statistics, what you want to pull out. Some of the statistics look favorable, but then when they looked at it more, we finally uh, just published a few days ago, and we had to change the title that there was no apparent correlation uh, between those. Now, if you don't see a correlation out in real life, it makes me less enthusiastic about the hope that I'm going to be able to feed a probiotic and make the bees more productive. Okay? So I'm not saying it can happen, but I'm saying I've lost my enthusiasm for probiotics has gone down about four notches uh, when I got the results of, of this experiment. Yeah. Pretty much uh, universal. Um, if you follow my articles now, I'm, I'm talking about that. There's, um, what they find is there's a little bit of, of hive to hive variation, even in the same yard, season to season, based upon the forage, and species to species. So if you look at Apis serrana, Apis mellifera, side by side, there's going to be some slight differences. But the core gut bacteria are pretty much always there. You have, so you have a little bit of tweaks on them, but the core is there. That seems to be pretty much uni universal. So now we get to salesmanship and marketing. What's that? So my the two pictures earlier, the some mat on the on the hive. What is that? <coughs> this is that. This is. Oh, you put a mesh over the entrance, then the pollen forgers who are coming in very quickly, quicker than my reflexes to grab them, <laughs> get slowed down for a minute so you can grab them. Okay? It's just just for the collection of the of them. Yeah. You know, I didn't put anything at all in this about entomb pollen. That's a good question. Apparently, when the fermentation process goes bad, the bees, instead of risking getting poisoned by removing it, they just cover it, they just entomb it, and they just leave it in the cells. I, I, something very interesting happened. Um, and when you know those events where you say, why didn't I take a photograph of it? And I've kicked myself 100 times since then. We came back from almond pollination. We're nuking up colonies. And here's a colony, and on a brood frame, there was this perfect arc, one cell wide, of entombed pollen. And I'm guessing that was the day they sprayed one of the fungicides in the almond orchard, and they just entombed that whole arc of pollen that, that day. But it's, it, um, I'd, I'd be very interested in doing more research. Dennis Van Engelsdorf has done some on that. He's found the chlorothalonil, the Bravo uh, fungicide in that. Um, we could stand a lot more research on entombed pollen. Okay? Okay. Now we get into marketing. As Kim said, you know, you, you have this, all these beekeepers with all this cash burning a hole in your pocket, you want to spend it, and man, is it easy to market things to beekeepers. I, I'll tell you, man, what a group of suckers. <laughs> <laughs> so my new probiotic uh, bee tonic coming out. <laughs> There's lots of health products coming out. I was going to start a formal trial of the health products uh, this fall. I didn't get to it. I'm planning now. Um, I've saved donations. We're going to our plan is, uh, right after almonds, we're going to start a full year-long trial of all the bee health products on the market and get some real data on them. <laughs> <laughs> so I searched the web for tonics and stuff, and man, you just put the right pictures on there, people just, the money just wants to fly out of your pocket to buy these, <laughs> these, these things. And they're out there, so the question is, yeah, are they our salvation, or are they just a snake oil? Here's a point. <laughs> When I ran my pollen substitute test, uh, which I'll show you later, uh, and got the results, immediately when there's results saying that your product looks good, when you advertise your product, those results will be shown on the ads because now you have actual data to back it up. Any product that makes any kind of health claim, if they're not showing data, that's because there is no data. Okay? So if you want to, anybody pitching a product to you to make your bees healthier, do what I do. I say, oh, yeah, I'd really be interested in seeing the data. Okay? I, I'm so used to asking that unanswered question, having <laughs> unanswered, and excuses. You should hear the excuses I get. Why? Oh, well, yeah, well, we gave it to these two beekeeper friends. They said the stuff worked really good. That's their data. Let's take it to market. Okay? That's the norm in the bee industry. One of the things is that yeast, uh, th this is a picture. I had a beekeeper, um, commercial beekeeper in California this spring. 
say, Randy, oh, my whole operation is crashing. There's thousands of hives. I've been, uh, they, got, they got nosema really bad. The tops of all the hives are covered with dysentery. She, again, repeated the myth that nosema and dysentery are, are related. They're not. Okay, dysentery is entirely separate from nosema. Okay? If you have a hive with nosema and they get dysentery and they desiccate in the hive, it will spread the nosema. But the nosema doesn't cause the dysentery. Anyway, he said, all my hives have nosema so bad, man, I just spent $40,000 on fumagillin. I said, man, why don't you send me some samples? So he sent me some B samples, and I looked at them under the scope. I said, well, none of those samples had nosema. Why don't you send me some more samples? So he sent me another five or seven samples, and none of those samples, one of, one of all of his samples had a little bit of nosema. The rest were completely clean on nosema. I said, I don't think your problem was nosema. I hate to tell you, you just wasted your $40,000 dollars on fumagillin, but I saw something I hadn't ever seen before. And uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but now that I've fermented that bee bread and recognized yeast cells, his bees had a bad yeast infection right across the board, and that was causing the dysentery. So before you spend a lot of money on fumagillin to try to cure dysentery, first spend a few dollars on a microscope and see whether, whether or not there actually is any nosema in your bee's gut. Okay, it, generally when I see dysentery, I see, either, I see either yeast or amoeba inside the guts. It's not, it has no relationship with nosema. That was a thousand right there, that's oil immersion. And then it probably was, I probably blew it up a little bit on top of that, okay. So that, a, to really see, on the, to see the internal structure of these, you needed to go to a thousand there. So what did you tell us? What did you do about it? I couldn't. I, I'm guessing that whatever nutritional protein supplement he was feeding him probably was making the bees sick. Okay. Put him on, yeah, something, something else. Uh, this is the other thing Kirk found is that in the off-the-shelf uh, protein supplements, a lot of them are just chock full of yeast. Start with, that's, that's, that's an issue. Okay, so here's another product. I won't put the name on here. And if you look here on the, on the, uh, bacteria in here. They also have, oh, dried Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Anybody recognize that one? Yeast! <laughs> so, yes, and I have spoken with this, uh, the salesperson for this quite a bit and um, waiting for any data, and this is one of those, yeah, we had a couple of beekeepers try out it, they said it worked, worked well. Um, so this is uh, on the market right, right now. I will be uh, uh, most likely testing this one uh, this spring. But very, again, very poor match between these bacteria and what are in there. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't work. Sometimes you get uh, an immune boost by having a, a, a non-symbiotic bacteria being introduced to your diet. So there could be something happening, but um, for a could be, I'd like to see some data. Here's some data. This was just published, uh, just came out, parasitology research from uh, Europe. They use two, yes, yeah, yeah. they use two um, different, uh, a probiotic and a prebiotic. Prebiotic is a, is a food product and one's a, and a probiotic. Uh, and uh, fed it to bees. And if you look at the, the survival of the bees in cages, the ones that were just fed sugar syrup live longer than those fed the probiotic. This was uh, um, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, a, a common uh, uh, animal and human uh, probiotic. Uh, not one that you normally find in the bees. So it made the bees live a shorter life, and it was all, he also fed it to see what it would do with nosema. And what it does, it made nosema counts go sky high. <laughs> so if you really want to hurt your bees, <laughs> this would be a really good probiotic to feed them. Okay? Then you have landscape issues. This is a hard presentation to put together because there's all these different things, so I'm hoping it. I, in fact, this morning I rearranged the whole thing, shifted everything around a different, different order. <coughs> okay, on really good forage, good nectar and a good mixed pollen coming in, bees thrive. Any fool can be a fantastic beekeeper when, <laughs> when there's good resources coming in. It's really hard to kill a colony. Yeah, that's my talk. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, certain crops, <coughs> like the brassicas, this is um, a prune orchard in California, and to make the, before bloom, this grower makes it more attractive to beekeepers by planting it with mustard, so the beekeepers will not ask for a pollination fee. <laughs> man, yeah, if I can move my bees on here, man, I'll move in for free. So it's cheaper for him to plant mustard than it is to 
pay a pollination uh, fee. Uh, excellent nutrition on the, on the brassicas. Um, some crops like dandelion are lacking amino acids, and if they're not balanced by another uh, flower that has a balancing amino acid at the same time, the bees will go downhill. You cannot rear brood to maturity on dandelion pollen alone in the lab. They, they, they will die. Okay, so dandelion pollen, yes, everybody loves, yeah, dandelion pollen is great. Only if it's mixed with other flower protein, uh, pollen coming at the same time. What's important in a yard is not how much honey you make in that yard during the honey flow. What's important is what happens the rest of the year. This is typical California forage for most of the uh, summer in the, in the foothills, what it looks like. It's pretty grim for the bees. Here's our main enemy. And I don't care if you're an organic farmer, a biodynamic farmer, or anything else. When you put the plow to soil, you eliminate 100% of species and 100% of habitat. And you replace it with a monoculture. And any organism that might try to consume the monoculture that you're putting on there is called a pest, and you try to poison it then. That's how we shift the environment. So it's not just being organic or, or, or chemical or whatever. It's the actual physical of the plow. The second big thing that's taken place is with the advent of Roundup Ready, we have much more effective weed control than we used to have. And now all that weedy forage of mostly introduced European weeds which the European honeybee evolved with, which is doing really well, now those weeds are, are gone. Um, those of you, I don't live here in the Midwest. When I came out here and started looking, and I've, tra I've, I've gone all over looking, I look at these soils that used to be prairie soils with, with dozens of species of deep-rooted plants growing and a whole variety of bloom, and I look at these soils with the carbon just being extracted from these soils, and essentially you turn this back to a sterile medium we are destroying our soil across much of the country. This is no longer wildlife habitat, and bees are wildlife. Okay, it makes it much harder for bees and other wildlife. Um, there's just no, no weeds left anymore. So we've increased this, this point of efficiency of farming <coughs> that there's no room for anything else. The bees just get the little bit of leftovers in the margin. Now, when we look at the monocultures that are planted, a really good blog uh, by Steve Savage, uh, Oh, God, I can't remember what it's called. You look at Steve Savage, he's, got, he's a, um, a, a plant breeder, but writes a really good uh, blog on what's happening out in, in the, the environment. This is the breakdown of crop grown in the U.S. in agriculture. Corn does essentially nothing for bees. Soybeans have, usually the pollen is locked up. You get very little pollen from soybeans, the bees do. You may get a short honey flow if you're lucky, but almost a, a wash for bees. Wheat, nothing for the bees. Hay used to be good for bees before they start cutting for dairy hay, and they start cutting it the moment you get a, a bloom on there. So that's why I got out of going to alfalfa, because it was no longer much good for me. Um, cotton, kind of a dangerous place. Steve could talk more about uh, how, how good <laughs> cotton is. depends on what they spray the cotton with. with. Um, uh, sorghum, silage corn, nothing for the bees. Out of this whole picture, you got a little tiny slice that gives anything at all to pollinators. That's how we've changed the agricultural landscape for pollinators. It's no longer pollinator friendly. Yeah? I can't read that. What is the one thing that gives the bees? Yeah, yeah. fruits, <laughs> vegetables, vegetables, a little bit of maybe some of the organic stuff here. A little tiny slice of the alfalfa that they allow to, to uh, 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 actually uh, uh, bloom. There's not much, not much in here left for the bees. I took this picture in, in, in Ohio here, this, this state, um, a couple years ago. I stopped the car, I go, oh my God, there are four land types right here. There is corn, there is soybeans, there is asphalt, or five types. There is asphalt, there is mowed grass. I've got to tell you, in Ohio, I had no idea what a passion for lawn mowing was until I came to Ohio. <laughs> I don't know if it's genetically wired here or what, but I have never seen people as enthusiastic about mowing as I see here in Ohio. It is insane. I mean, it's like there's not a blade of grass in the whole damn state that is, somebody isn't out there mowing all the time, which means there's no, nothing for the bees. And then you have these little patches of woodlot. The only, of this landscape, the first four, corn, beans, mowed, and asphalt, do nothing for bees. This is, they gotta fly and find little patches. It's pretty slim pickings, yeah. Hey, Rick, on the previous chart you had, what's your gut feeling on how that has changed and to what content and when the, the percentage? 
Um, corn and soy, the, the huge shift to feeding a uh, concentrated animal, uh, feeding operations where you take the livestock, you take them off pasture, and you put them into, into CAFOs, that's, that's it. 98% of all soybeans grown are for animal feed. Only 2% go for human feed or, or industry. It's, 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 it's all for animal feed. Most all the corn is grown for animal feed. Um, if we were able to, people ask me, what can I do? I said, demand grass-fed butter. Demand grass-fed beef. And that's what we do. We buy nothing but grass-fed butter and grass-fed beef. Simply, if we get the U.S. consumer to simply say, I want grass-fed butter and grass-fed beef, it would change the agricultural landscape and make it more friendly for wildlife and pollinators. So it's very simple. You just vote with your pocketbook. That's the simplest thing you do. If I can just get that message out. <laughs> the American housewife said, I'm going to buy grass-fed butter and grass-fed beef only. It would change the agricultural landscape. Really simple. You don't have to pass any laws or anything. <laughs> I will tell you right now, if you have the money, there will be enough. People, we, we pay, in the U.S., we pay 9% of our income on food. The rest of the world pays around the 30% level. We have the cheapest food on the planet Earth right here. If we were willing to pay a little bit more, yes, we could get whatever we wanted out, out there. And, but your point is well taken. There, is, there are trade-offs here. I don't have time to go into this a lot, but uh, your point's well taken. This is a recent uh, thesis published by Dr. Ra now Dr. Matt Smart, who uh, uh, Judy, Judy Wu and Matt Smart got, got married. Um, uh, Matt worked with the U.S. Geological Service and um, looked at Zach Browning's operation and looked at uh, bees placed in six different locations over, over two years. So these, all these dates, for those who can't see, this is from uh, June 21st to uh, September. And this shows on the pollen income the species are the families of the pollen coming in. So each of these colors is a different family of pollens coming in. And the amount of pollen is the dotted line right here. And you can see in areas where the, there's only one kind of pollen coming in, not much, the bees did pretty lousy. Where there was a lot of pollen coming in over a bunch of different species, the bees did really well. Independent of, of pesticides, independent of varroa levels, independent of nosema, the number one indicator of colony health and survival was the amount and type of pollen coming in. Okay, this is really I important. It's where you put your bees. Okay, then the question, when to feed. How, who's, who's watching time or anything here? Is it, is it, somebody let me know when it's time to take a break. Hey, can you get me a, a, a glass of water? Just out of the sink is fine. Thanks. Okay. This is some, uh, a chart, yeah. Yeah. Applied, applied mythology. Steve Savage, Applied Mythology. He had a great blog of really accurate information. Okay, I recommend it highly. Um, and he doesn't have an agenda that he's trying to push. He's just trying to get good scientific information out to people, especially on the GMOs, with the, um, this, the, this monster anti GMO hoax thing going on. Um, okay, this is data from uh, Tom Seeley over uh, several years. Whoops. Several years right here. Oh, hey, that's great. I won't spill that one. All right. Oh, sure. I get thirsty when I talk. And what it shows here is over the course of a year, any bar going up is when the colonies gained weight that week. Any bar going down is when the colonies lost weight that week. So when to feed <laughs> would be those weeks when the, the bars are going down. <laughs> Okay, when they're going up, there's no reason to feed. So what I would suggest is for your area, you make a chart like this. This is for my area that I make. You look at when pollen, and just go out to your hives, okay? And see when pollen is coming in in abundance and when pollen is going down, and plot that to your colony population, and it'll tell you when it's worthwhile to feed. Okay, so this would be local for your own neighborhood. Mainly I'm talking pollen. Mainly I'm talking protein. Okay, sugar's pretty simple. I'll, I'll get into that a, a little bit. Yeah. This is for my area, Charlie. This is, may not apply to you at all. Okay, and again, in, in summertime, where I live, we don't get pollen in, in the, we don't have that fall bloom that, that most of you guys are graced with, that, 
<laughs> I, was reading, I was reading a study out of Canada. Um, <laughs> yes. In, the, uh, uh, in Eastern Canada, uh, where the researchers uh, had pollen uh, supplemented and pollen deficient uh, colonies in the fall. And uh, they, they put pollen trap on half the hive, and then they fed that trap pollen to the other ones. And they said, wow, we didn't see any benefit to, to doing this. <laughs> so I, I said, I can't believe that. So I looked at their raw data, and what they showed was the number of square inches of, of the amount trapped, which was like five pounds a week from those hives. About 50% of the pollen that comes in gets trapped. So that means that those bees were bringing in 10 pounds of pollen a week. Even if you trap half of it away, that's not a pollen deficient colony to a California beekeeper. And then they said how many square inches of pollen, how many square centimeters of pollen they found in the combs, in the pollen deficient ones. And I calculated it out. It made a two inch band of bee bread around every brood comb. <laughs> This is not what I call pollen deficient. A California beekeeper would die for that much pollen deficiency in the, in the late summer. So, so um, beekeeping is different uh, where I live. Okay, so there, here's the thing. When I go to bee research funding meetings, I keep getting these beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, they've read about vitellogenin and how important it is in colony health. And if you want to see how healthy a colony is, you just, you just take the bees, you grind them up, you measure the amount of vitellogenin. They'll say, oh man, they're low vitellogenin. You better give them some protein, they'll be healthier. They said, well, let's, we need a test, man. We need like one of those pregnancy test kits, you know, so we can crush some bees in a Ziploc bag and stick the thing in there and come out and you see whether you have a pink line or a blue line or whatever. And I said, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Just go out and pull a frame out of your hive. You don't need any fancy tests. There's, there's a, a few ways of telling you. Number one, if you got lots of pollen coming in and it's mixed color. If it's all coming in the same color, it may be deficient. If it's mixed colors, the bees are probably okay. If they're rearing drone brood, that's the first thing the bees sacrifice if they are protein deficient. They're, they eat the drone brood and they'll stop rearing drone brood. If they're rearing drone brood, there's no nutritional deficiency. They have nutritional abundance. If you got the band of bee bread and it's different colors, that's generally a good indicator. But the main thing to do is to look back at this interface right here and look at the amount of jelly they're feeding the larvae. A really well-fed colony will just float every larva in a big pool of jelly. The moment they start going into protein deficiency, they'll start cutting back on that jelly. So here's some larvae with plenty of jelly. Here's larvae just with a little tiny dab of jelly underneath each one. Enough to keep them alive, but no excess jelly at all. That's your litmus paper right there. Really easy to see. And it's not black or white, it's gradation. You can look at how much they're cutting, cutting back. Here's larvae swimming in jelly. Look at, I mean, look at all that jelly right there. There's this colony, and when we go out to our yards, the first person out of the truck fires a smoker but well, we're untying the ropes, they go to a, a hive and they pull a frame out of the brood nest and we're waiting to say, it's looking wet or it's getting a little dry. That's what we want to hear. That tells us whether that colony, that yard needs to be fed protein or, or not. Here's dry brood, just sitting pretty much dry on the bottom of the cells. Wet brood, lots of white jelly. Dry brood, very little jelly around the larvae. Every, everybody clear on this? This is your easiest assessment there is. Okay, we, could, we want to have a, take a break now? Yeah, this is a good spot.